violent youth crime. It's not something that we normally associate with the decade following the end of World War II and the slightly later Korean conflict. Usually, these are the types of images that we associate with the carefree years of the 1950s and early 1960s. Or, to be more precise, these. However, violent youth crime was a genuine concern during that time and this concern over what used to be referred to as juvenile delinquency genuinely scared the daylights out of many parents, teachers, and other adult authority figures, often to the bewilderment of their children and students, most of whom were law-abiding, generally didn't have much interest in the current events of their youth due to responsibilities with school, work, extracurricular activities, and honestly pursuing each other as well as the then non-existence of social media, were often unaware of what some of their same age contemporaries were doing, both to each other and sometimes even to adults. And when we say juvenile delinquency, we are not referring to hubcap stealing or chewing gum in class. We don't mean this. More on how that primarily fictional image came to be at the end. For viewers who prefer their 1950s narrative to be along the lines of this, go to the top right and click for the options to hide and stop seeing videos like this. As 1950s fans and historians were about promoting reality while researching and reaching out to fellow like-minded 1950s fans. Since these have been the dominant image for decades for the 1950s, this video is for us. Now that that's out of the way, here are a few examples, a brief introduction, of real-life historic 1950s youth crime, the type of which caused a decade-long panic, nearly destroyed an American visual and print art form, and even caused a raw American style of music to shy away from its original roots into a more parent acceptable sound. Seriously, the Panic also gave us some classic movies and even a beloved musical stage play. And many of us thought the 1950s was solely about Finns, sock hops, and hula hoops. America's participation in the Korean War, sorry, Korean police action, was already two years in when local San Francisco Bay Area youth gangs had their own war of sorts that made national notoriety in March of 1952. That was when, just after midnight on March 30th, as the annual Butcher's Ball dance party was winding down, that 19-year-old Robert Arthur Ranson shot down gang rival Norman Botello near the fountain just outside of the Civic Center Auditorium where the dance was held. Ranson, at the age of 12, had suffered from a bout of rheumatic fever, the result of which compromised his heart, affecting his stamina and dashing his childhood hopes of becoming an athlete. Forced to trade in basketball shorts for a water bucket and handful of towels as a water boy on the basketball team, Ranson, to the dismay of his loving and hardworking parents, found the status that he was longing for by falling in with a gang of well-dressed teenage gangsters out of the Portola district. Racking up an impressive police record between the years 1950 to 1952, including burglary, assault, and car theft, the six-foot-three Ranson, described by one San Francisco reporter present at his later trial as well-dressed and handsome, also took to carrying a 45 caliber pistol and a shoulder holster. Well, we did say that despite his tall frame, he was physically compromised. Perhaps that is why, after agreeing to a group fistfight outside of the dance, with Ranson's Portolas against the much shorter Norman Botello and his gang from the Fillmore district, that Ranson drew a pistol instead. The girls from each of the different groups were also there, 
and Botello's girlfriend, 19-year-old Edith Apodaca, had even tried to disarm Ranson, grabbing our would-be basketball hero from behind before receiving the butt of Ranson's pistol for her trouble. That's when the Civic Center shooter shot and killed Botello, along with another 19-year-old, Andrew Ulibari, while wounding James Bennett, Thomas Hinman, and James Erickson. Sounds more like a scene out of many a 1950s TV and movie western than the stereotype of a 1950s gang rumble. Ranson would be handed a life sentence serving out his time in San Quentin prison, though, as we know, a life sentence doesn't necessarily mean an actual lifetime of imprisonment. According to the California Archive, which houses surviving historical documents and records for the state, Ranson was up for parole in 1966 but wasn't discharged until 1977. The irony is that Ranson and Botello didn't even personally know each other and hadn't met until the night of the dance. Yes, it was just like a teenage romance but in reverse, as they eyed each other across a crowded dance floor before deciding that he was the one. Ah, hate at first sight. Two more notable details should be pointed out. First, according to a surviving witness contacted through the San Francisco Remembered Facebook group, who was a teenager in 1952 and was at that butcher's ball dance, when shots were heard outside, many of the girls who were inside the auditorium actually ran towards the sound of gunfire. Really, girls? Second, surviving press reports frequently noted the well-dressed nature of those arrested in this entire affair, including Ranson himself. Ranson, his Portola gang, as well as their Fillmore mission and Portola Hill rivals and allies were, most likely, members of the White Shoe gang subculture. White Shoe because of the white buckskin shoes along with the clean-cut Ivy League mode of dress that participants in this very San Francisco 1950s subculture sported. Yes, that's Pat Boone, and no, he himself wasn't a gang member, as far as we know anyway. But these San Francisco white shoe gangs seem to favor the very same fashion sense that the singer of ballads like Love Letters in the Sand and notoriously laughable covers of Little Richard's and Fats Domino's rock and roll songs later popularized. Members of the White Shoe subculture would make national headlines again in 1956, again, just after a dance party, like this one on Halloween night of that year, as four members of a fashionably dressed group of boys decided to go on an after dance party stabbing spree. Among their victims was 15-year-old John Alpa Jr., whose heart had been pierced by a switchblade knife. The innocent non-gang member actually survived, and yes, that's his understandably worried parents. The four boys were later arrested, and again, just like Ranson four years earlier, their impeccably dressed fashions at the time of their arrests were noted. Just like Ranson, they had long records with the surviving documents provided by the California archives of two of them, Clement Anderson and Earl Hall, showing that as early as the age of 13, they had been arrested for possession of heroin. Whether or not they were well dressed as 13 year old drug pushers is not noted, but the arrest of youthful offenders of San Francisco's white shoe subculture show that not all 1950s juvenile delinquents resembled the black leather jacket and blue jeans greaser stereotype. Speaking of the term greasers, when referring to 1950s gangs, that regional term that was not used everywhere to describe 50s teen gangs could actually be applied to our next example. The back of the yards was a working class section of Chicago and the youth gang that gained notoriety from that area during the second half of the 1950s was the Rebels, who claimed Cornell Square Park as their turf. The Rebels were, however, just one of many 1950s-era teenage street gangs out of Chicago that garnered national notoriety 
due to their less than peaceful activities. Some of the harmless and carefree 50s hijinks that these stone greasers, as Chicago's teenage social clubs called themselves, included the July 1955 drive-by shooting murder of 17-year-old Kenneth Sloboda, committed by 14-year-old Clement Cookie Massis. No, not that Cookie. The 1956 shooting murder of 17-year-old Warren White, committed by 18-year-old Fred Cruz during a gang rumble. Cruz was later acquitted on the grounds of self-defense, and in case you're wondering, this is White's grieving mother and sister. And, on the subject of specifically the rebels themselves, and most infamously due to its randomness, the 1957 beating death of Farragut High School honor roll student Alvin Palmer, led by 18-year-old Joseph Schwartz and about a dozen other rebels. Schwartz was quoted as saying, it's N-word time, and no, that's not exactly what he said as we are speaking in code for social media. You can guess what he really said. And that he wanted to get a colored guy. When he randomly picked Palmer for a beating while the honor roll student was waiting for a bus after he had finished his after school job. Schwartz was sentenced to 50 years for the murder with state attorney Benjamin Adamowski stating, if that's what they want to be, we will treat them like rebels. Curiously, the rebels actually began not as a fighting turf gang, but as an athletic youth sports organization, focusing on activities such as baseball. The rebels founder, Pat Salmon, who had long since left the club before they made headlines, returned to the now fighting turf gang to try to turn them away from their now violent ways. By the way, the original Broadway production of Grease, no, not the movie, takes place in Chicago, though unlike the Greasers in that staple of many a high school musical production, the Rebels were anything but cute, funny, or harmless. There was a notable attempt to turn the Alvin Palmer tragedy into triumph of sorts, after the Alvin Palmer murder incident, the teenage organizers of the third annual Chicago Youth Rally at the Chicago Stadium, led by Mendel Catholic High School senior Tom Osborne, who, working closely with Judge Wendell Green, the first African American to serve at the circuit court level, dedicated their program to combating gang violence while promoting racial solidarity. They also had top rock and roll acts, such as Dean Vincent, among others, perform, turning tragedy into hope with music and a message of love, a full decade before Woodstock. Still, an innocent kid did die. Speaking of innocent victims, that brings us to our next example. Juvenile delinquency is a term that refers to youth crime, and while many of the juvenile delinquents of mid-century America that captured headlines were inner-city gang members, some were not. Take for instance the case of then 14-year-old Billy Ray Previtt of Pleasant Seat, Maryland. He was an early example of an active school shooter. Yes we unfortunately have had to deal with that problem for a long time, even during the carefree 1950s. This young psychopath and all-around bad seed didn't like being told to write I will not be disruptive in class by his Maryland Park Junior High School teacher back on May 4th of 1956. So he left the campus, drove back, and no, at 14 he certainly did not have a license, while returning with a 22 caliber rifle. When his rampage was over, three teachers would be shot down, including 32-year-old Fraser Cameron. Previtt bears little resemblance to the inner city gang members from the same time period that would inspire Hollywood's mid-century socially conscious films like Rebel Without a Cause, though Reading up on some of his behaviors and background prior to the May 4th, 1956 shootings, 
Previtt shared some similarities with Salmoneo's Plato character. As for the real-life post-war era youthful criminals, Previtt had more in common with youthful serial murderers, such as the so-called Brooklyn Thrill Killers, not truly a gang, but rather four deranged upper-middle-class high school students who murdered New York's homeless in the summer of 1954. Charles Starkweather, the notorious high school dropout and James Dean wannabe from Lincoln, Nebraska, who went on a murder spree of innocent Midwest residents from November of 1957 through early 1958, including two beloved Bennett High School seniors, remembered by classmates for their selfless generosity. Madeline Allred, an 18-year-old babysitter who drowned a three-year-old placed in her care, Patricia Tiernan, at a Detroit hotel bathtub in March of 1957, or Nashville, Tennessee's Howard Ray Criswell, who, at the age of 18, shot at innocent passersbys and tourists at the Woodbine and Murfreesboro roads for a period of three weeks in the summer of 1960 before he was captured. Criswell, in particular, noted his urge to kill. Then again, so did Madeline Allred. Just like Previtt, Criswell would be sent to an institution for the criminally insane, but Previtt beat out Criswell and his contemporaneous teenage colleagues in notoriety as, due to whatever bureaucratic errors at Jessup, Maryland's Petusan institution, Previtt, as a career criminal, would be officially released, re-arrested, then officially released again before being committed again. Yeah, as you can see here, Previtt was a real cute kid on his way to an ignoble adulthood. He's not a bad boy because he made me see how, how love could be. But Earlier, we referenced beloved classic mid-century Hollywood movies that tackled the then problem of youth crime, aka juvenile delinquency, since for most of us today, and even for many back then, these fictional films were, and are, our initial introduction to the very real subject of mid-century youth crime. 1961's The Young Savages, starring Burt Lancaster as an assistant district attorney charged with prosecuting New York gang members for the murder of a blind boy, who turns out to be a gang member himself, may not be as iconic as either Rebel Without a Cause or West Side Story, but it is remembered by both fans of classic cinema and critics as a well-made urban crime film and courtroom drama that still holds up quite well today. Like many Hollywood classics, it was inspired by real-life events. Ripped from the headlines would apply here as we take a brief look at the inspiration for Evan Hunter's book-turned-movie, the real-life Cape Man case, and the Egyptian King's street gang. This is a... Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom. 
This oddly named street gang, made up of primarily Puerto Rican, African American, and some, as shown in the mugshots, white teens, sparked national outrage and concern when, in the summer of 1957, they beat a 15-year-old partially handicapped survivor of polio by the name of Michael Farmer to death while also wounding Farmer's friend, 16-year-old Roger McShane, over the use of a swimming pool. The whole affair had to do with a rivalry that the mostly Puerto Rican Egyptian kings and another gang, the Dragons, had with a mostly Irish teen gang, the Jesters. We say mostly because even though 1950s gangs identified along supposedly ethnic lines, there were exceptions to this rule, as we can see here in this Life magazine photo of the Jesters. The actual disputes were about neighborhoods and turf or territory, and the Highbridge Park swimming pool was disputed turf. When one of the members of the Egyptian kings was asked if he felt bad about murdering the handicapped farmer, the boy responded, what the hell kind of question is that? Of course I feel bad. I'm caught, ain't I? Not only did this incident inspire Evan Hunter's A Matter of Conviction, the novel that would be adapted into the film The Young Savages, but the Egyptian kings themselves would be referenced in Spielberg's more recent version of West Side Story as part of the background for this version of the Jets as their pre-Sharks rivals. However, one of the fictional gang members in The Young Savages was visually inspired by a notorious New York gang member remembered for an unrelated incident two years after the murder of Michael Farmer, the Hell's Kitchen playground murders of 16-year-olds Bobby Young and Tony Krzyzynski in the summer of 1959. We were surrounded by gangs, but we weren't a gang. When other neighborhood kids would ask about us, I would tell them, if you want to rumble, Go screw around with the bops, the gang kids on the west side. If you want to sing and dance, then come hang with us. Paraphrasing, this is essentially what Billy Lucan, who as a young adult served in the U.S. Marines during the Cuban Missile Crisis, told reporter Mike McGallery in the November 10th, 1997 issue of New York Magazine. Lucan was recalling his teenage years during the 1950s, growing up in New York. McCallery's article came out in 1997 amidst the controversy surrounding Paul Simon's Broadway musical The Cape Man. Like West Side Story, critics lauded the show's musical score, a unique blend of Latin rhythms and doo-wop. Even more like West Side Story, The Cape Man musical dealt with the subject of 50s-era New York youth gangs. However, unlike West Side Story, the Cape Man was met with protests from the families of victims of violent crime, including the relatives of the victims of the murder featured in the play itself, Anthony Kurzyzynski and Bobby Young Jr., both of whom were 16 years old when they were stabbed to death by Salvador Agron on August 29, 1959. Agron was also 16 at the time, a gang leader, the real life Cape Man that the play references and, as stated, the visual inspiration for Neil Burstyn's Anthony Batman Aposto character in The Young Savages. In one sense, the Cape Man case was tragically all too common during the summer years of the late 1950s. During that summer of 1959, a separate series of gang-related incidents shocked the nation. A 14-year-old boy was fatally stabbed and a 15-year-old girl was gunned down while sitting at a bench talking with her friends. While New York and the rest of the nation reeled from those incidents, less than a week later, the reports of the gang-related Cape Man murders grabbed the headlines. What made the Cape Man case stand out, however, was that this time, the victims were not gang members themselves. Billy Lucan my best friend was a Puerto Rican kid named Junior Melendez, who could sing and swivel his hips like Elvis. We were just doo-wop kids trying to get lucky before the Labor Day weekend. Lucan had a group of friends, all rock and roll music fans. They hung out and vocalized on street corners and hallways, 
hoping to impress the local girls with their singing abilities while trying to impress each other with imaginary and non-existent sexual conquests. They also enjoyed playing pranks on each other while thinking about their lives after high school. Besides Billy, Bobby Young and Tony Krzyzynski, there was also Billy's 14-year-old sister Sandy and another friend, Ewald Reimer. They all decided to hang out at a local playground located in Hell's Kitchen and not far from where they had just finished watching, ironically, Otto Preminger's crime thriller courtroom drama, Anatomy of a Murder, at the old Criterion Theater. There had been a light shower, but it was still summer and teens hanging around late at night was not unusual. As they hung around, about to engage in a bit of impromptu vocal harmonizing, they were confronted by Agron, sporting a cape that he had just exchanged with his friend who was also there, 17-year-old Luis Hernandez, now holding Agron's sharpened umbrella. The two teen gangsters were backed up by several members of the Young Lords, the Heart Kings, and Agron's own gang, the Vampires, formed after Agron had left the Mau Maus earlier that year as that gang had been under police pressure following the February 23rd shooting committed by one of their own, Carl Sintron, upon teen gang rival Anthony Lavancino just outside of a Flatbush Penny Arcade. Surrounding the boys, Agron snarled, Where's Frenchy? Billy Lucan remembered. They look scary. We didn't know who Frenchy was. I just wanted to protect my sister. Frenchy was Jose Cordero, one of Agron's vampires. Frenchy had started a rumor that some Puerto Rican teens had been beaten up by a gang of white teens called the Nordics, supposedly because one of the white gang members had a mother with a substance abuse problem and, supposedly, one of the vampires attempted to sell her marijuana. Fact-checking was not high on the list of gang priorities. Agron's vampires and their allies just saw a bunch of white kids hanging around at the park where they were supposed to rumble, and for Agron, that was enough. As Agron pulled out a long jeweled dagger that he concealed under the cape that he borrowed from Luis Hernandez, he shouted out, No gringos leave the park! Krzyzynski, Young, Reimer, and Lukin were slashed. Despite their wounds, Tony Krzyzynski and Bobby Young wouldn't go down without a fight. Billy Lucan, as well as his sister Sandy, who states that when the fighting started, Hernandez actually let her out. He let me pass. The Umbrella Man let me pass, she stated. Remember Krzyzynski and Young throwing punches, their shirts bloodied and torn after getting slashed and pierced before they ran, stumbling from the park and bleeding into nearby apartment buildings. Krzyzynski, holding the hand of a girl in one of the apartment's hallways, collapsed and died, while the mortally wounded Bobby Young was let into an apartment occupied by an elderly man by the name of John Brody, who again, ironically, had just finished watching Frank Capra's 1944 dark comedy about humorous murderers, arsenic and old lace. Young actually died near the television set where John Brody had just finished watching the crime comedy, the crime scene photo of which was featured in several national headlines covering the case throughout September of 1959. Billy Lucan and Ewald Reimer fought back as best as they could unarmed, but they also fell, injured, though they would survive. Lucan had fought to protect his sister, who though struck in the face, escaped relatively unscathed. As for Agron and Hernandez, they would forever gain notoriety as well as their aliases that night as they and their fellow bopping or fighting gang accomplices fled the scene of the murderers. As they ran, witnesses who saw them and their exchanged accoutrements told both the police and the press, it was that cape man and that umbrella man who did it. And the names, which they never used nor were known for prior to that night of August 29, 1959, would go down in notoriety in the history of the post-war generation. Later, after Agron's and Hernandez's capture, Agron would jokingly remark to Hernandez, If we hadn't switched, 
You'd be the cape man, and I'd be the umbrella man. Hernandez would think to himself, Yeah, Sal, but you were the one with the effing knife. Agron's capture came about almost by accident. Following the murders, there were mass arrests and dispersals of New York teens who were out after a citywide curfew. Officers George Peoret and Pat O'Hara had dispersed a group of teens playing around a garbage can at one in the morning, and when one of the kids walked away in the opposite direction while ditching what appeared to be a knife under a nearby parked car, the two officers grew suspicious. When they told the boy to come over, he acted polite and cordial, which further aroused their suspicions. It was, of course, Agron himself who, like Hernandez, was on the run and hiding, both of them together in various abandoned buildings and friends' homes, including the apartment of a local gay man who they hustled for room and board. With a citywide panic and mass arrests following the murders, Agron's capture seemed anticlimactic. However, his sentencing as the youngest person at the time to be placed on death row was another story. Among those who petitioned for mercy for our children was former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who by the 1950s had become a philanthropist and social activist. Her arguments were based in part on Agron's age and partly due to revelations of abuse that Agron had suffered, more on that in a separate video. Due to the efforts of activists like Mrs. Roosevelt, Agron's sentence would be commuted to life and he would actually be paroled two decades later in 1979, 20 years from the night of the murders at the Hell's Kitchen playground, which seemed to be a slap in the face to the survivors Billy and Sandy Lucan and Ewald Reimer. After all, there were many children who grew up abused or from broken homes. This was the generation that was born during and grew up in the aftermath of World War II, some of whom had fathers who either made the ultimate sacrifice in service of their country during the war or came back with undiagnosed PTSD. And most of these children who grew up under such conditions never murdered anyone. Speaking to New York Magazine at the time of Paul Simon's Cape Man musical, Ewald Reimer understandably bitter remarked, The Cape Man killed them kids and stabbed me. I don't guess that's anything to sing and dance about. Billy Lucan, my youth died in the park that night. We never got together again after their funerals. No graduations, weddings, or baptisms. Skinny, that was what we called Tony Kurzyzynski, he was my best friend. I still go see him sometimes when I drive by Woodlawn Cemetery. Recollections, like the one that Billy Lucan or Ewald Reimer related in that issue of New York Magazine, are not usually what one reads or hears about when the subject of growing up in the 1950s is brought up, at least not in mainstream, nostalgic recollections. Though as stated, certain fictional movies dealing with the same subject are often brought up and lauded as classics. A brief look at the phenomenon of 50s nostalgia is in order here, since that subject relates directly to how we perceive 1950s youth crime today, or as it is more commonly called, 1950s juvenile delinquency. Sunshine, goodbye rain She's wearing my school ring on the chain She's my steady, I'm a man I'm gonna love her all I can This day is our Nostalgia for the 1950s can be divided into two distinct yet related subjects. There is the personal memories of senior citizens of specific ages who would have been teenagers between the years 1955 to 1962, the rock and roll era. Then there is specifically the 50s nostalgia fad, a craze that swept the United States, Britain, and many other countries during the 1970s. For Americans, 
It was a feel-good revival expressed through the rediscovery of specific rock and roll songs, usually the most sedate mainstream teen ballads, and expressed through certain iconic movies, TV shows, and a specific musical stage play turned movie. Considering that both West Side Story and The Cape Man has already been covered, this last category would also seem to be a common theme. To be sure, Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey's 1971 musical comedy turned 1978 movie is one of the major influences on how today's mainstream remembers 50s era juvenile delinquency. Less as emotionally troubled or marginalized youth from dysfunctional homes or impoverished neighborhoods where a willingness towards violent behavior was not only the norm, but sometimes even something to be admired, but instead as mischievous pranksters in leather jackets, bad but not really bad, whose behavior was certainly nothing like the violent gangs of today who engage in street drugs and shootings. This is the depiction of the cute, lovable, and harmless gangs featured in Greece, as well as in American Graffiti, The Lords of Flatbush, and Happy Days, though to be fair, in the case of the first season of Happy Days, before the show switched to a live audience format, one episode, Knock Around the Block, did show street gangs for what they actually were, and for their potential for violent crime, within the confines of a 1970s family-friendly sitcom, of course. Combine these fictional comedic portrayals with the fact that, unlike today's teens who are connected through social media, the teens of the 1950s generally kept within their own social circle. The only real interest 1950s-era teens showed towards other teens from around the country was the upper-middle-class teen interest in the dancers on Philadelphia's American Bandstand. And that was it. It's one reason why, if one were to question an American senior citizen of a specific age, if they've ever heard of the bandstand regulars Bob Clayton and Justine Corelli, or Arlene Sullivan and Ken Rossi, they might be familiar with those names, regardless of where they grew up. But ask a non-New York or non-Philadelphia senior citizen of the same age if they've ever heard of the Cape Man Salvador Agron, or the Umbrella Man Luis Hernandez, or if they remember the tragedy of In Ho O, and most likely those names would draw blank, in spite of the fact that the Cape Man murders were national news in 1959, and the beating murder of In Ho O was international news in 1958. The adults of the 1950s were concerned with youth crime while their teenage children's interest in the subject, provided that these were families from affluent neighborhoods with relatively low crime rates, was specifically focused on the aforementioned fictional movies such as Rebel Without a Cause and West Side Story. And to these specific 1950s teens, who admittedly make up the majority, juvenile delinquency of their youth consisted of their upper-middle-class friends, who saw James Dean up on the screen and imitated his style of dress, his mannerisms, and his on-screen attitude, without any of the actual reasons, such as poverty, mental health issues, substance abuse, or dysfunction that motivated someone like Salvador Agron or Charles Starkweather. And that remembrance is just a step away from the comical fiction of Greece, the bad but not really bad pharaohs in American graffiti, or the pre-Rocky, pre-Fonzi lords of Flatbush. This comical fiction of 1950s juvenile delinquents that elicits both a strange sort of affection for a simpler, carefree, as in relatively non-violent, time, along with disdainful chuckles from the mainstream, is a product of an America recovering from the shock of the late 1960s, particularly the Vietnam War, the first war to be televised, bringing the horrific realities of armed conflict into American homes on a daily basis. <laughs> 
The shadow of Vietnam was often dangled to viewers in some of these 1970s, 50s nostalgia films with both American Graffiti and The Wanderers, a movie specifically about New York gangs, being examples, as both movies were actually set in the early 1960s when America's involvement in Southeast Asia was beginning to expand. This sanitized, bad but not really bad 50s delinquent greaser a Chicago and Great Lakes term that was never used by the bops of New York nor the Bart's, Munns, Pachucos, and White Shoes of San Francisco, became the humorous mascot for selling repackaged rock and roll oldies collections during the 70s era 50s nostalgia fad. And that mascot is still with us today. It's why children's sock hop costumes resemble the stereotype of the post-war youthful criminal an image that did consist of actual real-life convicted killers, though it's a fact that most parents and probably even most grandparents are unaware of. As the shadow of Vietnam looms in the narrative of some of these nostalgic movies, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the first use of the delinquent stereotype as a funny, goofy mascot for rock and roll oldies came in 1969 at Woodstock, the iconic three to four day music festival that was a celebration of the hippie counterculture. There, amidst the various acid rock and folk bands, the Columbia University neo doo group, formerly known as the King's Men, made their big debut as Sha Na Na, singing the songs that would later be included in those oldies packages while dressed in the stereotype of a 50s era teenage gangster. Considering that rock and roll's association with youth crime goes back to 1955's Blackboard Jungle and its use of rock around the clock over the opening credits, combined with the counterculture's disdain for the thin neckties, pegged slacks, and leisure suits favored just a few years before, not only by mainstream society but by actual 50s era doo groups, Sha Na Na's use of a laughable parody of 50s streetwear was probably the right move at the time. And that is the image of the 1950s juvenile delinquent that is with us today. That laughable mainstream image is also why we have avoided the use of the term 50s juvenile delinquent in the title of this video and have instead opted for the title post-war youth crime. The contributors to this video have found out the hard way, that the term 50s juvenile delinquency sparks images of Fonzie and Grease's Danny Zuko while eliciting chuckles rather than serious discussions about the socio-political ramifications of the Michael Farmer, Alvin Palmer, Inho O, or Cape Man murder trial cases between 1957 through 1959. Curiously, if the 1970s fad for 50s nostalgia eradicated the actual reality of post-war youth crime from collective mainstream memory, while utilizing the visual stereotype of the 50s teen gangster to sell oldies LP collections, Halloween sock hop themed costumes, and retro themed diner menu items, another movement that recalled 50s roots rock and roll music. This movement, originating in Britain with an influence from America's East Coast, revived the interest in the actual history of post-war youth crime, while also introducing its adherence to the more rarer and wilder sounds of 1950s youth music culture. But that's an involved story worthy of another video. This was an introductory video into the history of 1950s era youth crime made by fans for fans of 1950s youth culture. It is a different approach towards mid-century youth culture. For fans who enjoyed this video and would like more documentaries with this fan approach towards 1950s culture, we have several YouTube documentaries which are posted for free educational viewing. For those who would like to support the continued research that goes into making these videos, we also have a Patreon page and a new 1950s documentary series separate from the free YouTube videos and exclusively for Patreon patrons, which will give a detailed look at specific individual cases and incidents of 1950s era youth crime. 
and that will be up soon. The lives and backgrounds of the Cape Man, as well as the Brooklyn Thrill Killers, among others, will be detailed, and for fellow researchers, you do not want to miss that series when it comes out. The links for all of these videos and projects are included in the description of this post. Please feel free to share this video and spread the word as we want to reach more fans, particularly fans who would like a different and a more grounded, realistic, and perhaps a bit more grittier look at the time period that we know to be much more interesting and relevant than how the mainstream usually and sadly laughingly portrays it.